So let's pray. Jesus, as we do every week, we ask for your spirit to come and teach us. Give us open hearts to receive from you and you alone, we pray. Amen. So we've been talking about living a spirit-driven life. We use that Greek word pneumatikos from pneuma, spirit or wind. And Paul uses that word to uh, talk about living life while still on this earth, while our feet are still in the mud, while we're still sailing in the turbulent waters of this earth, we can put our sails up and get the wind of heaven in our sails. And we can live a life that doesn't leave us at a dead end. It leaves us with a live end. It doesn't wear us out. It rejuvenates us. It doesn't tear us down until we're finally done. It actually transforms and builds us up until we're finally complete and whole. Um, and it involves just going about life seeking first the kingdom of God in our lives. And what does he say? I'll take care of the rest. I'll make sure the food, clothing, shelter that you need are there. We have a hard time living that because it seems like this, the needs of this life are more real than the spiritual stuff that you can't see. Whereas we have to recognize that when we actually can see the spiritual, this stuff is going to seem ephemeral. This stuff is going to seem like it's lightweight, like it's not real. We don't believe in something that's less real. We believe in something that's more real, but it's hard to keep that reality in our brains. So we've been talking about living a spirit-driven life. And um, last Sabbath, after I was done, after second service, one of the uh, one of my good friends among the members here, and I, I wish I had his exact words, but he basically said, so are we ever going to get around to talking about sanctification, obedience, holiness, and uh, its importance, its necessity, as, as if maybe I've been dancing around the topic but never nailing it. Now, I don't know what nailing it means. Am I supposed to stand up here? and tell you all what to do, get with this, get with that. Um, but I did, get, I got an interesting email too. Um, great sermon yesterday, Pastor. I thought I'd read that part to you. <laughs> he said, I believe in what you said because that because of Jesus, we have a choice. Was that in the context of choosing to be allowed to be changed by the Holy Spirit? When we look at Enoch, Moses, Elijah, etc., we see transformation there too. Remember I said, the last, I said last week that Jesus restores choice. And I put it this way, and you've heard this illustration many times over the last 26 years, and that is we're born on a sinking ship. We don't have any choice that we were born on a sinking ship. And the ship's going to go down no matter what we decide to do with our lives. We can live a good life. We can live a, rep, live a retrobate life. We can do good things. We can do evil things. We can be a nice person. We can be a lousy person. But when the ship goes down, we'll all be just as dead. So in a way, we have minor choices within a limited sphere, but in terms of to live or to die, we're born without any choices, naturally. And the only reason we have choice to get out of this world alive is because Jesus built a lifeboat with a seat in it for you and me. If there's no lifeboat out there, we may be able to decide whether we're drinking, you know, um, Coke or Pepsi when we go down, but we're still going down. The real choice isn't there until Jesus comes. He builds a lifeboat, and now I have a choice. I can get in the lifeboat, and according to the claim of the one who built the lifeboat, come out alive. Or I can stay on the big comfortable boat and go down when it goes down. The ultimate choice, I mean, if you think about it, 
what we call choice is completely inconsequential. What am I going to have for dinner? What am I going to do with my life? Who am I going to marry? What am I going to do for a career? But in the end, we're going down with the ship. <laughs> so we have a little, we, we can fiddle with the dominoes on the Titanic. But when she goes down, we're all going down. Jesus restores choice. When Adam and Eve sold out at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we lost our choice. Up to that point, we could choose good or evil. Once we chose an evil, we're stuck with evil. And if Jesus hadn't have come and restored that choice, we'd just be stuck. Now, I remember hearing a, an evolutionist who was dying of cancer give a talk shortly before his death about how proud he was to be an atheist evolutionist and, and um, that he was going to die and become nothing, but he left some children and some good DNA and whatnot and so forth. He said, you know, life has no absolute value, but it can have plenty of proximate value. I thought, isn't that comforting? I can be approximate. <laughs> yep, that's it, approximately. And he was so true. Without Jesus, life has only proximate value. You can make a little difference while you're alive, but in the end, you're going to be dead. And in the end, everything's going to be dead. In the end, everything we've done is either going to freeze out or burn up. And it's all going to come to absolutely nothing except for Jesus. He gives us back our choice. We can come out alive. Now, if that's a fairy tale and I die believing it, I'm going to die happy. And then I'll be just as dead as the rest. But if it's true, I'll die in Jesus and I will live forever. I think it's a pretty good bet. Can't prove it, but I'm going to go with it. So that's a actually longer version of what I said last week. Jesus restores our choice. So the question that this uh, good church member asked was, I believe you said because of Jesus we have a choice. Was that in the context of choosing to be allowed to be changed by the Holy Spirit? And I would have to answer the question, no. That was not my context last week. My context last week was simply the choice. We have a choice to come out alive instead of coming out dead. We have a choice for a live end instead of a dead end. We can get to shore to live as opposed to going down in the cold, dark Atlantic night with the Titanic. However, it's a very good question. I sat down and answered the email. I said, concerning your question, comment about because of Jesus, we have a choice. Yes, I certainly would include transformation in that, but I was thinking more fundamentally and basically that without Jesus, we're on a sinking ship without a lifeboat, and I've already been through that. But with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we're given a choice. He's built the lifeboat. There's a seat for me. Um, the avail availability of the lifeboat and seat takes me from having no choice but to go down with the ship to having a choice to go down with the ship or get in the lifeboat. But I believe that getting in the lifeboat, making that choice inevitably involves transformation because you will be hanging out with Jesus on the lifeboat. You can't be on the lifeboat and not be with Jesus because he didn't just build the lifeboat, he is the lifeboat. So if you choose life, you choose Jesus. And if you choose life, you're choosing to be with Jesus. And if you hang out with Jesus, you're going to be transformed from glory to glory. You understand glory to glory means better, 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 better. He will transform us into more and more of the original glory that he intended. We spend too much time on original sin and we forget about original glory. God made us to be glorious statues of God walking on earth. He wants to restore us to that inner first, because that's the most important, 
and then it is coming, he'll make the outer catch up with the inner. Because we'll be hanging out with Jesus on the lifeboat, and by, be, by beholding Jesus, we'll be, we will be changed into his image from glory to glory. Um, and then I said I'm going to be talking about that next Sabbath, so here we go. Life in the lifeboat is transforming. Even should I choose while on the sinking ship to be transformed to be more like Jesus. Even if I choose while on the sinking ship to be more like Jesus or like whatever, I'm still going down with the ship. I may be the more caring, more liked, more valued because my demeanor while I'm on the sinking ship, and that's morally positive for me and those around me, will have a nicer life until the ship goes down. <laughs> and then it all comes to an end. I would suggest that one cannot choose both life and death at the same time. You can't choose to live forever without getting in the lifeboat. That's like trying to live while you're dying. I'd like to live while I'm living. By being given life in Jesus, that life is both quantity forever and quality transformation. I believe the two inevitably go together and cannot be separated. Um, can we talk about sanctification, transformation, holiness, obedience, and I'm going to use those terms as synonyms. Can we do that without becoming behaviorists and legalists? Can we still have the gospel? Justification is the theological term for what God has done for us already. It's all God. It's all by faith alone. It was completed at the cross. My sin was crucified with Jesus, or should I say my sin was crucified in Jesus. You realize, in Satan's attempt to kill God, he killed my sin. Have you thought about the irony of that? He thought he was doing God in, but he was really doing my sin in. So when he nailed Jesus to the cross, he nailed my sin to the cross because Jesus took my sin. Now that was the clever thing, and I, clever is a very poor word. But that's the way Jesus flipped the whole thing. He let Satan kill him, but he took my sin before Satan killed him, which means Satan killed my sin. So I'm not saying Satan is my savior, <laughs> but he sure played into the process unintentionally. He actually worked in such a way that God flipped what he did to be salvific instead of destroyed. Does that make sense? Now you do realize that every sin you ever committed or will commit, and every sin from the first sin of Adam to the last sin before Jesus comes was all put on Jesus. Because he bore sin, what does the Bible say? Once for all, once for all. So if you sin again in your life, there's probably a reasonably good possibility of that happening. Well, that surprised Jesus. Oh boy, they did it again. Now what am I going to do? We come to Jesus, we say, oh God, I did it again. Can't believe it. I can't believe I did it again. And what does God say? Let's see. Yep, I already had that one down. We took care of that 2,000 years ago. You didn't surprise me with it. I understand. I still love you. So justification means that Jesus bore all my sins in his body on the cross 2,000 years ago. 
You'll never surprise God with your next sin. You may surprise yourself, but you won't surprise God. And he's already got it handled. He took care of it 2,000 years ago. Justification has to do with you accepting what God has already done for you, and it takes you from death into life in a millisecond. The moment you connect with Jesus, when you have Jesus, you have life, right? So justification is accepting what Jesus has already done for you. Sanctification, on the other hand, is accepting what Jesus, what God wants to do in you and to you. And it's not a finished work because it's a process. And that's where we went into trouble. Well, if I'm in process, then when am I saved? The moment you start the process. How alive are you today? Well, let's see, how alive am I? On a scale of one to 10, I guess I'm a 10, I'm alive. In fact, it's more like digital, it's on or off, right? I don't understand digital electronics, but I understand it's all zeros and ones. Transistors either on or off. And how they do so much stuff with just turning something on and off, I don't get it, but it works. You're either alive or you aren't. Even if you're sick, you're still alive. You're not a third alive, <laughs> on or off. How married are you, you who are married? You're either married or you aren't. You can't be half married. Yeah, I've got a, I got married 44 years ago, but it's, you know, it's down to 30%. You're either married or you aren't. One day, we walked into a church completely unmarried, and about 3.10 in the afternoon, I think it was, we suddenly went from fully unmarried to, he, the preacher asked if we did, we admitted that we did, and we became married, right? 46, 44 years later, are we any more married than the day we got married? Forty-four years later, are we any more married than the day we got married? No. We're not 110% married. We were only 80% then, you know. We didn't work up to this thing. And I believe it's the same way with salvation. The moment we receive Jesus, we go from death into life, from lost to saved, from out to in. We're a mess, but we're saved. Anybody who's been married longer than five minutes knows that when you got married, you didn't have a clue what you were doing thought you did and we're very different now but we're not anymore married we've been transformed hopefully in a positive not a negative direction some marriages go up some marriages go down they have ups and downs but you're still married and I believe the moment you accept Jesus you have salvation you're a mess you're a broken mess but you're saved now Bless God's heart. He doesn't want to leave you a mess. Isn't that wonderful? Um, we kind of like our mess sometimes. And we hang on to it because it's become secure. We're comfortable in our mess. But God says, no, no. If you can just get a glimpse of what I have for you. Let me have at it. I want to heal you. I want to transform you. And that's called sanctification. That doesn't make you less secure in salvation for two reasons. Number one, transformation happens inside salvation, in order, not in order to get in. You get an education while you're living, not in order to come alive. Right? You learn to walk and talk and control your bowels and all the other things that you do while you're growing up. 
But you don't do that so that you'll be finally someday alive. You're alive and you grow within life. You're saved and you grow within salvation. So we're going to talk about being changed. All that change comes within salvation, not in order to get into. And that's where sanctification and discussions on obedience, well, how much obedience, how, how on a scale of 1 to 10, how high does my obedience have to be in, in order for me to be saved? No. Do you have Jesus? Then you have life. Now, he wants to teach you how to live. Because face it, a two-year-old really doesn't know how to live. You have to give them some education along the way. But they're still alive. Does all that make sense? Another thing that I think is important that we think of if we're going to talk about obedience and sanctification is that, and you've heard this, I'm not going to try to prove it this morning, said it many many times but it's hard to remember sanctification transformation obedience is as much by faith alone as is justification we often are taught that sort of I was raised that Jesus saves me praise the Lord now I better get on with trying to develop that Christ like character and I do all I can to develop that trice-like character and overcome this sin. And once I get that one taken care of, I move on to this one. And once I get that one. And that now it wouldn't, it wouldn't succeed if God didn't kick in some power to get me over the top. But I do my best to scramble up and then he boosts me over. And that sanctification is a combination of divine power and human effort. And I believe that is a lie. Um, I hang with Jesus. He does the transforming. If I don't know that I have eternal life, any attempts at good living will be attempts to be good enough to be saved. If I know I have eternal life in Jesus, any attempts at good living are simply to let him live his life out in me. I can't be any more saved than the moment I get saved, but I can certainly start living it more completely and fully. For two reasons. What are the two reasons? I've told you this a gazillion times. Number one, God wants me to experience life. Do you want your kids to just get by and drag their guts to the grave? Or do you want them to thrive? God wants his kids to thrive. He wants you and I to experience maximum life. And where is maximum life found? In him. Anything else is a few thrills on the way to death. So he, he calls us to maximum life because we're his kids and he wants us to experience life to the full. And the other reason he wants us to experience life, holiness, is because... Satan says it's not good, it doesn't work, you wouldn't want it. And God says, oh, I need you out there living it so others can see he's a liar and that his, my ways are good, complete, pleasing, life. So there's good reason for transformation. I'm just going to shoot one verse at you. It was the first. Oh, and it's not a holy night. Oh, I got a little chart. I like this chart. I'm going to go through this. You've seen it before. And then I'll go to one verse and then we'll be done. Justification is by faith alone in Jesus. Amen? I believe sanctification is by faith alone in Jesus. I come to him. He does the changing. Justification is forgiveness. Sanctification is holiness. Justification is new birth. You get life. Sanctification is new life. You live life. I mean, if you get born, don't you want to live? Justification is reconciliation. Sanctification is transformation. Justification is acceptance by God. Sanctification is obedience to God. 
Justification is what saves me. Sanctification is what changes me. Justification is what God does for me. Sanctification is what God does to and in me. And it's all God in both cases. It's not all God and justification and, you know, 10% me and 90% God or 90% me and 10% God. All I can do is get with God. He's got to do the transforming because the transforming that matters is inner, not outer. And I can't do inner stuff. I can only do outer stuff. And he says, when I do it in, you can work it out. But you got to work out what I do in. We won't get to that verse today. Justification gets me into heaven. Sanctification gets heaven into me. And both are necessary. Quoting Morris Venden, they are different in purpose, but they're the same in method. I seek Jesus daily to know him in intimate personal relationship. John 17, verse 3, eternal life equals knowing Jesus. Jesus does 100% of both justification and sanctification, saving and transforming. 1 Corinthians 1.30, he is my wisdom, my righteousness or justification, my sanctification or holiness, and my redemption. He gives me the smarts to even look to him in the first place. Then he saves me, he transforms me, and he transports me. And he does all of it. Both justification and sanctification are necessary for salvation. Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And Jesus guarantees the outcome from the start. Philippians 1, 6, if we let him begin the good work, he will bring it to completion. I don't know how he's going to get it done in the shortness of the rest of my life, but he says he will. And that's why it's by faith alone. It's because I have to trust that he'll do what he said. I can't accelerate it. I can decelerate it by never hanging out with Jesus. But the only thing I can do to make it happen is to hang out with Jesus. So when somebody asks, are we ever going to get to talking about holiness and sanctification? If we're talking about hanging out with Jesus, we're talking about being transformed. Because you can't hang out with Jesus without being transformed. Justification, get with Jesus. Sanctification, stay with Jesus. Does that make sense? All right. This one verse. We'll just take a moment on this verse and I'll be done. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We're not going to talk about pursuing peace. It's a compound subject. Pursue. I mean, it's a compound predicate. The subject is you. It's an imperative. You get with it. Do what? Pursue. What does pursue mean? Go after it. The guy just caught the ball. Tackle him. Pursue. Let's not sit back in your easy chair. It's go get up and go after peace with others and holiness. That's the word for sanctification, hagiosmos in the Greek. So forget the peace with all people. We're just going to go with holiness. And by the way, there's a definite article. And I think that definite article is important, even though the translators don't think so. Pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Is holiness necessary? Without it, you won't see the Lord. So how holy do you have to be before you'll see the Lord? And you see where we can get in talking about sanctification. Well, I could start saying, well, until you're doing this and doing that and not doing that, and for sure not doing that over there, you're not holy enough to get there, and we just turned the whole gospel upside down. If I know I have salvation in Jesus, I can actually pursue living his life to the max without, being, without pursuing trying to be good enough to get saved because I know I already am. I'm already in the family. You have children and they're pursuing an education. 
They're not pursuing the education in order to get into the family. They are family and they're pursuing. So I'd like to suggest that holiness is absolutely necessary. And where we run into the problem is much of the Protestant world says, well, but holiness can't be a matter of salvation because I can't lose salvation if I don't get enough holiness or the gospel isn't free. And yet if I say holiness is necessary, now I've got to decide how holy I am. Am I holy enough to be saved? That's the wrong question. Holiness is something that happens to saved people. It's not something that gets you saved. And Jesus is in charge of holiness. So if I'm pursuing holiness, what am I actually pursuing? Jesus. And yet, shouldn't I want, shouldn't I plead with God, shouldn't I be hoping for transformation? Get rid of this rot and get on with good? Get the... the, the, the the uh, dead stuff pruned off and get on with some fruit. I think I should be greatly bothered by my, my temper, my, uh, my lust, my greed, my whatever it is. If I take that casually, am I seeking life? No. But if I'm finding myself falling and failing, what do I need to do? Work hard on not falling and failing? Or be more intense on seeking Jesus. I believe pursuing holiness, the only way I can pursue holiness is indirectly, and that is by pursuing Jesus, who is holiness. Secondly, evidently holiness is possible or he wouldn't tell me to pursue it, right? I can become a new person, praise the Lord. I'll be a lot easier to live with. Thirdly, it's specific pursue the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I've got to go to find out what that holiness is, not start making up my own rules and passing them on to you. The Pharisees decided they'd figure out what it was and added law after law after law by the hundreds to God's laws. And Jesus said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You make someone twice the son of hell you were to start out with. I got to pursue the right holiness and there's only one who's truly holy and that is Jesus. And fourthly, it's to be pursued. And let me say it one more time. If I'm pursuing holiness and do not know that in Jesus Christ I have 100% salvation, then I cannot help but be pursuing salvation. But if I know that in Jesus, I'm a family member, I'm a son, I've been adopted, I'm an heir, I'm in him. And when I have Jesus, I have life. I can now pursue that life with all the rest of the energy I have, which equals pursuing Jesus. But I can pursue, I can want that life, go after that life without it trying to be going after getting saved because I already know I am but it's got to be within salvation. So that's the introduction um, to what I was going to talk about today. Will we ever get around to talking about obedience and transformation and holiness? I think we have been. Amen. Because talking about obedience and transformation is not talking about all the rules you need to be keeping for proper Sabbath keeping or stuff you should eat or not eat or drink or not drink, there's a time to share the biblical information on that. But God has to work it in your heart. And I firmly believe that if you're spending time daily sitting at the feet of Jesus, he knows how to bring up the topics that need to be brought up. And he may have me bring them up in the pulpit or he may just bring them up quietly in your own quiet time with God. But he knows how and when and which and what. He knows whether today you need to be working on issue A, B, C, or D. And if I'm preaching on A, he may be working on D. So I think the best thing I can do is keep telling you and keep reminding you and keep helping you know how to walk with Jesus. And Jesus 
will take care of holiness. Let's pray. Jesus, may we pursue you because you are holiness. May we recognize that we can never work holiness, but you are holiness. And that transformation is always in the passive. We never transform ourselves. We are transformed. By beholding, we will be transformed. By the renewing of our heart, we will be transformed. May we sit at your feet daily. May we plead for the transformation because we want to experience life and we want to demonstrate life to the rest of the world. And as your children, we now have that opportunity. We now have the choice to become holy. And we exercise that choice by choosing daily to sit at your feet and walk with you. We pray for that holiness. And may we give you lots of time every day in our lives every moment of every day to work that holiness in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.